Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. This year, 2020, marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which guaranteed women the right to vote. Central Park celebrated the occasion by unveiling a statue by sculptor Meredith Bergman, which depicts the three leaders of the suffragist movement. They are Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. With us to help us understand women's long, hard struggle to get the vote is Lynn Scher. Lynn Scher is a TV anchor, an author, and a long distance swimmer. She is co-host with Emily Goodman of a fabulous podcast entitled She Votes, The Battle for the Ballot. We're pleased to welcome Lynn Scher back to the program. I thought we might start with this great statue in Central Park. I don't know whether you attended the unveiling in August, but uh, it really is very dramatic and is the only uh, statue in Central Park that uh, portrays live women. Uh, real women. Non-fictional women, real no. women. Uh, I've been down. Alice in Wonderland, but uh, this is the only one of, of women who actually live. Indeed it is. And I, I, I was invited to the um, ceremonies. I was unable to make it because I had other responsibilities that day. But yeah, it's about time. You know, I've been, I've been writing about um, uh, the uh, monuments to women, statues of women for um, more than 40 years, almost 50 years now. And it's about time we got real women and those real women in Central Park. And, you know, I, I used to say nearly every pigeon in America has the statue of a man on which to perch. Uh, usually a general on top of a horse. So it's about time we got a lot more real women and having Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Sojourner Truth there is just great. It, it gives little girls and little boys uh, some really good people to look up to. I think uh, there's a factoid that um, all over the country, there are only 40 statues of live women. Oh, that, that's, there are more than that. There, when I first uh, started researching the subject, uh, this was back in um, 19, in the 70s, there were only 40. We've got a lot more now. Oh, okay. And that 40 number, though, is, is what it was at the time. And uh, thank goodness we've awakened to the fact that there are women worth commemorating and really heroic women worth commemorating, whether you've heard of them or not. Uh, this is the chance for people to know, to learn more about the real women in our lives. Uh, now, uh, it strikes us uh, surprising as we sit here today that uh, in, it took the United States of America until 1920 uh, to give the vote to uh, women who at the time of the Constitution comprised about 39% of the, of the population. What accounts for this? Is this just uh, male arrogance? Uh, is it uh, not willing to share power? And what was behind uh, denying women the vote? Well, I think you put your finger on it. I think it's about sharing power. Nobody wants to share power. And the truth is in this country, it was white men, white men who were property owners who had the power originally. Uh, they had no interest in sharing it with people of color, uh, with people of a different gender, uh, and with people who didn't have any money. So uh, that's what held it up in this country. Now, actually, at the time of the 19th Amendment, there were at least 12 states uh, in, in the West and, and maybe some more, including New York, uh, that had given women the right to vote. Well, as you well know, uh, the right to vote was always regulated by the states in this country. There was nothing in the Constitution about the right to vote. And therefore, the states, uh, once they figured it out, they were able to give women and others the right to vote uh, before there was a federal amendment. New York State in 1917 was a real breakthrough moment when, when the New York State Constitution was amended so that women would have the right to vote. Um, it changed the outlook for a lot of women around the country. But you're quite right that it was individual states. And before states, there were individual territories that gave women the right to vote before they even were states. Wyoming, uh, Utah, Idaho, and I think Colorado 
all gave women the right to vote as territories before they became states. So um, they knew they knew it was a good thing to do. And also they thought it might attract women out to those strange boundaries out in the new frontiers. So uh, they knew what they were doing. So of the three women in uh, Meredith Bergman's dramatic uh, sculpture in Central Park, only one is a woman of color and that's Sojourner Truth. Now, perhaps you can remind us of her contribution uh, to uh, women's suffrage. Uh, Sojourner Truth was formerly enslaved um, in New York State, by the way. Let's get rid of the myth that slavery was only in the South. Uh, she, she got herself out of slavery. I think the phrase is self-emancipated, which means she somehow got herself out of it. Um, and she then became a very famous uh, orator, a lecturer on the, on the circuit, and also a suffragist. She was very prominent in the field of um, uh, 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 pushing for women to get the right to vote. She spoke at women's rights conventions. She was a friend of Susan B. Anthony's and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she also was, um, she had a lot of religious issues she dealt with. Uh, she wound up in Battle Creek, Michigan, where there are, by the way, is at least one statue to her, perhaps more. So Sojourner Truth was very well known in her day. She wrote a book, um, that is to say she had a book uh, she had stuff published. She was actually illiterate. She never learned how to read or write. Um, but she was a very, very powerful speaker and a great leader. Well, and uh, she was also uh, capable of uh, demonstrative evidence because in her, uh, she attended a meeting in Battle Creek, Michigan, where she spoke, and she was heckled, and some uh, man in the audience accused her of not being a woman. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that may very well have happened in Battle Creek. There, there was another instance somewhere. And, and the, he, but Jim, what's really important about that story is that it, it speaks to the whole issue of men um, not believing that a woman who was a real woman could possibly want her rights. There was this image of women as supposed to be at home, taking care of children, in the kitchen. And if you stepped out of that sphere, if you wanted to be in the other sphere of public life, you were accused of being unwomanly or unsexed. This was the worst thing that someone could say about you. And every single suffrage leader was accused of being unwomanly and unsexed. Even Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had seven children. And, and for um, Sojourner Truth, who was a very tall and muscular um, all those days in the field uh, as an enslaved person, um, she was a woman who really, who really had a strong body. And, and she was accused of not being a woman. And she had to go, perhaps it was behind a curtain, it's not clear, but she had to show her breasts to prove that she was a woman. This is what the suffragists were dealing with in those days. And the suffragist movement really grew out of the abolitionist movement, didn't it? Yeah. And they were very closely related. It's amazing. A lot of the early suffragists, particularly Susan B. Anthony, were abolitionists, uh, working very hard to abolish slavery. And it was while realizing the discrimination against the enslaved people that so many women said, wait a minute, um, you can't have a hierarchy among human beings. We too are discriminated against in a different way, perhaps not with the same brutality, but we too do not have our rights. And it was a combination of seeing their own oppression as they worked for others' freedom. And also in the beginning, a lot of the male anti-slavery groups would not let women speak, would not let women participate in the meetings. So the women formed their own female anti-slavery groups and suffrage really did grow out of quite a bit of that. And you know, Jim, what's so fascinating is that it's exactly how the modern women's movement, the second wave in the 1970s, grew out of the civil rights movement, very much the same thing. Women working in the civil rights movement saw their own oppression and women working in the civil rights movement were often told to make coffee, not policy by the guys in charge. Okay, so let's move on to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. 
uh, she hosted a, a, a conference about women's rights in Seneca Falls, New York. Uh, tell us about her. What was her contribution? Elizabeth Cady Stanton grew up the daughter of a pretty prominent attorney in upstate New York uh, when she was Elizabeth Cady. And Elizabeth, the story goes, Elizabeth was so offended by the laws against women. She saw all these women coming into her dad to ask for help, how they could get out of certain situations they were discriminated against. And Elizabeth saw these laws and as a child, she took a scissors and she cut the laws out of the book. She thought, I'll make the laws go away. Later when she grew up, she found a much more effective way to do that. And she and um, another very, very uh, famous abolitionist named Lucretia Mott, Quaker woman from Philadelphia, uh, got together and they formed this um, Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848. This is upstate New York, sort of halfway between Rochester and Syracuse, New York. And the point of it was to talk about women's rights. And for the very first time, they demanded the right to vote for women. This was a completely radical notion at a time when women had almost no civil or political rights. And they were, um, they did that in this meeting. It was quite extraordinary. Okay, so we move on to uh, Susan B. Anthony. And she did more than just uh, speaking about discrimination and uh, demanding the right to vote. She was willing to put it to the test. So Indeed. tell us how she did that. Susan B. Anthony was introduced to Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1851 uh, in Seneca Falls. Susan was not at that first Seneca Falls convention. She, they were introduced by Amelia Bloomer, the woman whose name is attached to the Bloomer costume, those pantaloons that women wanted to wear so they didn't have to wear long voluminous skirts and petticoats and crinolines. But anyway, uh, oh, another reformer. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became very close. Uh, I think of them as the indivisible odd couple of the suffrage movement. Uh, Stanton was short, kind of plump, had lots of children, always fussing around the house, but a brilliant, brilliant thinker. Susan was tall, slender, um, a spinster, as the press would put it. She would never married, um, and she had time to give to this movement. So the two of them worked together. Now, they worked for, uh, starting in 1848, it took 72 years to get us the right to vote that came out of Seneca Falls. But in 1872, Susan B. Anthony had a better idea. She thought, enough of this, I'm just going to go and vote. And she was urged on uh, by some lawyer friends who said that the new, um, there was a new uh, amendment to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, which made the freed slaves now were citizens of the U.S. And the lawyer friend said to Susan, hold it, you already have the right to vote. If you're, a, if you're born in the U.S., you're a citizen. And we all know that if you're a citizen, you get the right to vote. So Susan encouraged other women, and she herself grabbed 14 other women in Rochester and went off to the polls in 1872 and voted for Ulysses S. Grant for president and a bunch of other Republicans uh, down the ballot. So she said, I have this right, I'm gonna do it. She voted straight Republican. She voted Grant and she voted the straight Republican ticket. Because those days the Republicans were the progressive party, as you well know. Susan was never willing to attach herself to one party or the other, uh, except insofar as the party would support woman's suffrage. She always said, I will work with, not for, any party that supports woman's suffrage. Well, then she also relied on the 15th Amendment, which said no one shall be, uh, no citizen shall be denied the right to vote on the basis of a previous condition of servitude or race. So uh, she was really being denied the right to vote, not on the grounds of race, but on the grounds of her gender. And Susan B. Anthony, two weeks after she voted, was arrested for the crime of voting while female. The uh, marshal came to her house. She was probably one of the most famous people in the world, certainly in Rochester, New York, where she lived. They all knew and loved her. And the marshal came to the house and said, Miss Anthony, uh, you need to go downtown to get arrested. And she said, well, if you're arresting me, I want to be treated like a man. Any man you would arrest. She sticks out her hand, says, I want to be handcuffed. 
well, he didn't handcuff her. Uh, he did take her downtown in the trolley, and in the trolley, the conductor came over to get her fare, and she looked at the marshal. She said, I'm here traveling at the expense of the U.S. government. Ask them for my fare. So she was very clever. Okay, so she's arrested. If you're arrested uh, and you plead not guilty, you get a trial. So she got a trial. Was the trial in Rochester or somewhere else? The trial uh, originally was going to be in the next county over, and uh, Susan B. Anthony went on a speaking tour, and every night for the entire month before the trial, she um, made a speech uh, that said why she was not guilty and why they should find her not guilty. Um, and they were so upset, and they thought she had tainted the jury pool, that they then moved the trial to another venue the next county over, uh, in Canandaigua, New York, in Ontario County. And Susan went on another speaking tour, another 22 days, and every night she spoke about why she should not be on trial and why she should not be found guilty. Um, so you had, a, you had a trial, and the presiding officer was a justice of the United States Supreme Court for this monumental occasion, and the jury was all male, the marshal was a male, and uh, they uh, had a trial, and they said she tried to vote and she was a woman. Uh, the prosecution rested the case and she wanted to take the stand. And what did the judge say? Nope, you're not qualified. Can't, can't testify on your own behalf. Can't testify on your own behalf. She couldn't testify. So she sat there with this all white male jury um, determining her fate, a white and a judge and, the, and the pro everybody was male, obviously. The prosecution argued she was a woman. Women can't vote. She voted, therefore she's guilty. And her, the defense didn't ever argue any of that. Of course she's a woman. And yes, she voted. That What their argument was, she did have the right to vote because the federal government had nowhere said women couldn't. They just put all these obstacles in place. Okay, so the judge directed the jury to convict her. Totally unconstitutional. This whole thing was a travesty of justice. Complete. And Susan was um, irate, to say the least. Her lawyer was irate, to say the least, when the judge dismissed the jury. And by the way, Jim, there is some evidence from some interviews that were done after the fact that the jury might well have acquitted her. But the federal government wasn't having any of that. They could not deal with sharing power with all these women that would be voting if Susan B. Anthony were allowed to vote. So. Um, uh, she was not allowed to testify. The jury was not allowed to deliberate. The judge directed the guilty verdict. And then the judge made a terrible mistake. Right before he pronounced sentencing, he said, has the prisoner anything to say? Oh, my goodness, did she ever. And let me just read you what she said. Lawyers call this an allocution. Everyone who is convicted of a crime before the sentence as the right of allocution. And uh, I suppose he thought she would say nothing, but uh, she said, yes, your honor, I have many things to say, for in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights, my judicial rights are all alike ignored. And what the judge say, the court cannot listen to a rehearsal of arguments the prisoner's counsel has already consumed three hours in presenting. And she went on and said, um, uh, she wanted to say some more. He said, the court cannot allow it. And she said, but your honor will not deny me this one and only poor privilege of protest against this high handed outrage upon my citizens' rights. May it please the court to remember that since the day of my arrest last November, this is the first time that either myself or any person or of my disenfranchised class has been allowed a word of defense before judge or jury. And the judge said, the court orders the prisoner to sit down. It will not allow another word. And she said, when I was brought before your honor for trial, I hoped for a broad and liberal interpretation of the constitution and its recent amendments that should declare all United States citizens under its protecting aegis that should declare equality of rights, the national guarantee to all persons born and naturalized in the United States, but failing to get this justice, failing even to get a trial by jury of my peers, I ask not leniency at your hands, but rather the full rigors of the law. And then finally, she sat down 
and the sentence was, find a hundred dollars. And what did she say? I will never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. Now, we have a president of the United States now named Donald Trump, and he's uh, famous for giving pardons out right and left, and he recently offered a pardon to Susan B. Anthony. I suppose he thought he would get the women's vote that way. What is the feminist reaction to the Trump pardon of Susan B. Anthony? Uh, the first reaction is no thank you. The second reaction is I bet you he never even heard of Susan B. Anthony before that day. Um, he did a really dumb thing. I know this will surprise you. Susan B. Anthony never wanted to be pardoned because if she's pardoned, it means she was guilty. She wasn't guilty. She was convicted uh, wrongly uh, because she voted while she was female, period, end of sentence. And what she would have liked is for her fine to have been remitted. She applied for that several times, never happened. She did not want to be pardoned. In fact, she loved the fact that she was convicted and she donned out on this for years to come. She would go to suffrage convention after suffrage convention and tell the story and she would say, and then I said, handcuffs please, and everybody would burst into laughter. And she raised money. Um, she raised money for the suffrage treasury by selling a transcript of the trial, 50 cents a piece, all went into the suffrage treasury. And she spoke about it, and it was a it was a badge of honor for her. And this pardon is just a a, a dopey um, a public relations stunt to please some people who have hijacked her name in other ways. Susan Susan doesn't want to be pardoned, and I will speak for her right now and say no, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I think you're you have company because the director of the Susan B. Anthony Museum in Rochester also rejected the pardon. Um, so. 47 years go by, and we have the 19th Amendment, which says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Uh, we have, women have had the right to vote. Uh, we've produced uh, some female leaders like Sarah Palin, Martha McSally, Susan Collins, uh, Martha Taylor Green in Georgia, who uh, professes to follow QAnon, uh, has it been a sign of progress uh, that we gave women the right to vote? Absolutely. It's been a complete sign of progress, despite the fact that, number one, it was a flawed amendment. It was imperfect. Uh, it, indeed, uh, women did have the right to vote, but if you lived in a place where there were horrible, vicious, awful people who enacted Jim Crow laws uh, that stopped you from getting to the polls, you did not. So millions of African-American women, women, particularly in the South, did not get the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Uh, the Native American women did not get the right to vote for some time. Uh, uh, American women of Chinese and Mexican ancestry also had to wait for more citizenship laws to come their way. However, it was exactly the right beginning. And overnight, the voting population in this country doubled. This has never, ever happened historically before. Never. Having said all that, yes, I believe there's progress. Um, I believe it is possible we will have a historic gen uh, gender gap in this year's election. Gender gap being the difference between the way men and women vote. Women tend to vote more progressively. Um, and the fact that you named all those women who are elected officials or were elected officials who don't seem to much care for women's issues, women do not vote as a monolith. We are not one block. Women vote along many, many different lines. Uh, in fact, during the suffrage campaign, a majority of women in the early days were opposed to women's suffrage, believe it or not, did not support their own right to vote. And I think a lot of that filtered down through uh, the days of the moral majority and in mo our modern era with Phyllis Schlafly and the anti-ERA people. So there is a modern component of that. Uh, women don't all vote alike. Women vote differently. But, but, there are more women than men in the country. There are more women than men who vote. And there are more women than men who vote more progressively. So there's hope. So if Susan B. Anthony were voting today, um, and straight Republican voter that she was, 
Do you think she would be voting for Donald Trump? Nope, I told you, she didn't, she didn't align with any party. And her, uh, when the Republican Party in 1872 finally gave them a little mention in their platform, in their, they gave them a little plank that said some version of, um, and the Republican Party recognizes women or something silly like that. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton said to Susan, that's not a plank, Susan, that's a splinter. And, it, and, and ultimately, it was nothing. Um, and, and Susan said, and someone went to Susan, and so one of the reporters said, but why are you supporting the Republicans? You are a Republican, right? She said, no, I will vote with, not for, the party that, support, that supports woman suffrage. So today, she would definitely be voting um, not Republican. Not Republican. Lynn Sher, this has just been marvelous. Thank you for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Be well, stay safe, and take care. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best.